I recall an episode of Star Trek Voyager that always hit me very hard. In fact, it was Star Trek Voyager's 100th episode. And it always hit me really hard. There were themes in it that I think spoke to certain spiritual aspects, I think. So you have this episode called Timeless. The Voyager, uh, you have this spaceship that had been thrown way off course, and they were slowly traveling to get back home, right? They had been stranded far from home, and they have this incredibly long journey, basically as long as a human life, to get home. And I'm seeing a lot of biblical themes here, right? Because we as humans are, are lost, right? But in our lives, once we find Christ, we are making our way home, right? But we have to wait our whole lives, 60, 70, 80 years, till we die, right, to make it home. So you have this starship Voyager traveling through dangerous, unknown territories, and it just gives me a lot of sense of what we as Christians go through. We're on this journey of through unknown territory where, you know, certain things are safe, certain things are not, and you just kind of, you trust in God through this journey, it, 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 it reminds me of our journey. So, so Voyager is traveling through these many difficult and dark places and enemies, but they're always somehow kept safe. There's something special going on there where they are safe. Safe. They, they do make wise choices. They avoid dangerous areas. They refuel and resupply from time to time. But in the episode of Timeless, we see a worst case scenario for Voyager in which Voyager was destroyed and plunged into an icy grave on this planet. It, it crashes and it, 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 boom, you know, that something went wrong in the journey, right? And, and they become shipwrecked. In any case, though, in this episode, two of the crew who did survive find a way to go back and change history so that they can change the bad decision they made. One of the crew members uh, was named Harry, actually sacrifices his life to correct the mistake and make things okay again. You know, we as Christians also face decisions that can either keep us on the right path or begin to lead us astray. The Bible talks about our faith journey like we're sailing on a ship, right? We're sailing home. We want to avoid shipwreck, though. We want to keep the course. And I've seen decisions in front of me as a Christian where I'm facing a temptation. An old friend wants to hang out. I see a drink or drug in front of me, and I, I can see where it leads to that to that icy grave, right? It leads off course. And that's not where I want, where I want to go, and it's not where I'm going to go. But I've avoided those pathways and followed the path of life. We too must learn to follow the pathway of life. The great thing is God helps us and protects us every step of the way. And he guides us. And he help us, helps us to make the right choices. But I want you to remember this as well. Even if you end up here and you tumble off the path into the, into the clutches of sin and death, God has provided even pathways here to change history like Harry and Chakotay did and reset things so that you can be back on course, okay? Even if you end up on this ice planet, guess what? God has set up things for you to, again, find the right path, even in a place like this. So that's the great thing. God's purpose is that we would not stumble or fall off the path and have to repent and come back to him. But it can happen. But God has provided a pathway back to him even in that. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you. Thank you so much that you, you change history, God. You do. You, you've changed my history. You've changed all of our stories uh, to, to make a new future, God. And uh, I just love how you do that, God. And thank you for this journey that we're on, home to paradise. God, thank you. We just pray you'd speak to us, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. And uh, I want you to keep in mind the journey of Voyager and kind of compare it to your own journey through life and your journey home. So Galatians, we're going to be in Galatians 5, and we're going to start at verse 13 here. And we're going to build our structure of faith today. And what we're going to be looking at is two towers. Two towers, okay? And here's what Galatians 5, 13 through 15 says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, Rather, serve one another humbly in love. 
For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Okay, so here's our structure beginning to form. This is for a Christian who is walking, still in, living in the flesh, but walking by the Spirit, right? And here's what we see when we compare the Spirit to the flesh, right? There's this internal battle that goes on in the believer between their new nature and their old nature, right? And here's the, the new nature brings freedom. The, the Spirit brings freedom. That's what you've got to understand about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings freedom, the flesh, it brings slavery. Anyone, anyone who's ever here been caught in a sin knows about that slavery where you, you, you almost feel tied up in something bad. But God can break those chains, right? But it just, it's a yucky feeling. Freedom. But that freedom is meant to bring humble service and love for your neighbor, right? That's, that's the point of that freedom in Christ is not to indulge the flesh, but to, it brings humble service, just a, a gratefulness for that relationship with God that it leads you to service, right? Like, man, I, I love God so much, I want to serve. I want to love my neighbor. But then the flesh, it brings slavery, and that slavery leads to indulgence, and it can lead to, like it says here, biting and devouring our neighbor, right? Sort of a hostility toward people. So we've been called to freedom, and Paul is teaching this to the Galatian church right here. And, he, and he's trying to remind them, because the Galatians had certain Judaizers who had snuck in their midst and were saying, wait a minute, you've got to go back to the Old Testament law. That's the best way to follow Jesus is by following the Old Testament law. And Paul says, no, that is not true. That is not the way to follow Christ by following the 413 commands of the Old Testament. Wrong. Don't do that. They're trying to get them back to, you know, sacrificing animals and, and hand washing and uh, just different law practices, not eating shellfish, different things like that, not wearing mixed fabrics. And Paul is like, no, that's not. The law of Christ is one, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. That fulfills it all. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, actually, you're free in Christ. You don't need to follow the Old Testament law. But do consider yourself at least obligated to love your neighbor. That's, you should sense, I want to love my neighbor from a place of relationship. So yeah, we see this within ourselves, I think, this battle between the spirit and the flesh from time to time. And, and Paul is reminding them, walk, walk in the spirit. Okay. So it continues in verses 16 through 18. So I say, Paul says, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Okay? So we continue to build our structure. Walk or be led by the spirit, and then you will not gratify the fleshly desires. That will not be a thing that you even want to do. You won't want to gr gr gratify the fleshly desires if you are being led by the Holy Spirit. It just will naturally, a lot of this is just going to flow naturally downward. Okay? If we're walking by the Spirit, if we're, we understand we're in freedom, if we and, and indeed then love humble service and we love our neighbor, we're going to be walking and be led by the Spirit, and it's just going to keep kind of filtering downward into everything we do. Similarly, if we're walking by the flesh, we begin to get locked in slavery and in indulgence, biting and devouring, and then we'll eventually begin to gratify the fleshly desires as well. So there's a, there's a progression on either side. <clears throat> so this is really the key if you want to break this sermon down to one phrase, walk by the Spirit. That's, that's it. Walk by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we as Wesleyans, I think, talk about the Holy Spirit more than a lot of other denominations, which is, which is good. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit ends up being the forgotten member of the Trinity, right? But we want to walk by the leading of the Holy Spirit, being practically led by the Spirit. And we can be. That's what the Word says, that we can, in fact, walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit which is a great thing. If you do allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life, then you naturally will not then gratify the fleshly desires. 
Next, we get a list here from Paul of 15 ways in which believers can end up walking in the flesh. So he lists off in verses 19 through 21, the acts of the flesh. And he's going to, he's going to, he's going to compare this then in the next verses with the fruits of the spirit. So this is a comparison as well. Here are the acts of the flesh. We see sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. And you can see what I want you to notice is a lot of these things are connected, right? Hatred is going to lead to discord. Discord leads to jealousy. Selfish ambition is going to lead to, to dissensions and factions. I mean, it's all connected. These, kind of, these things kind of foster each other, right? They kind of fuel each other. And he says that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. So we see on the right here that if you gratify these fleshly desires, they lead to the acts of the flesh, right? And those are those, that list of 15 items are the acts of the flesh. All right. Next, we see the fruits of the Spirit. So if we gratify the desires of the flesh, these things result. Okay? Then, if we are walking by the Spirit, these things result. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it says fruit of the Spirit, right? You could say the other things are the fruit of the flesh, right? They're, they're, what we bear out of our beliefs. They bear, they grow out of what we believe and do, sure? Okay, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And notice these things are connected again. Love connects to joy. Joy connects to peace. Peace connects to forbearance. Forbearance, kindness, gentleness, self-control. All these things are kind of linked up as a beautiful fruit tree producing beautiful, good character aspects in us. Okay? It says, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So he's saying we, we do not live like that list in 19 through 21. We instead uh, are called to live by this list of love, joy, peace, patience. You know the song. Come on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does anyone know that song? Okay. <laughs> I know Chelsea does, so. <laughs> like it goes, the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. Fruit of the Spirit's not a banana, right? And then, you, then it lists the song. Anyway, okay. So if we consistently allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, we will begin to grow fruits in our lives that express these various aspects. These all, are, I think, just break down to, again, love. Love your neighbor. It all breaks down to one thing, love. And they are, they're all connected as this lattice work of beauty, love, glory, goodness. Okay. So, again, a progression, right? Belief leads to action. Action leads to fruit bearing. It all is connected in a process. So if we are walk and led by the Holy Spirit, we will then begin to produce the fruits of the Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay. And then Paul also adds this, though, in verses 25 and 26. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited and envying each other. Okay? It says that right here. There's a sense here given of keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, like a consistent daily kind of what, what's the, you know, What's the Spirit saying? What is God saying? What's, you know, what's the lifestyle today? Listening for the Spirit's promptings. Uh, it's an art form of sorts, I think. It, and we stay in step with the Spirit. We kind of just walk by, the, by His leading. And that is not a, that's not a pushy process. It's a very gentle process. It's a, it's a very love-oriented process. It's a relational process. This is not, I know some of you are going to start thinking, cruel taskmaster, that's not it. That's just not it. It is a love-based relational focus, okay? I know, I know that we, we often get to think, do, 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 do. No, be in Christ, and then these things naturally flow out of that. Does that make sense? Don't get in the attitude of this pressure on the back of your skull. Do more, loser. No, that's not how God is. God is walk in the loving relationship with me and it will naturally flow out of that. 
Okay? Good. So it, it, it also reminds us, though, um, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Because in this process, I, I, I think we do have to guard against, well, look at all these fruits of the Spirit. Wow, I'm pretty cool. Um, wow, I'm better than other Christians. No. We want to stay humble in this and say, no, we're all equal. I'm bearing certain fruits. Other Christians are bearing other fruits. It's all, we're equal, right? Don't get conceited in this thinking, look at me with all my fruit, you know? Look at my big basket of apples. No. Stay, understand we're equal. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Paul continues. So I, I, I do want to continue over into Galatians 6. The Lord specifically prompted me to go into a little of this as well. He says this, and I, I don't want to do all this here, but just mainly the first portion. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens is the concept there, right? And you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what's the law of Christ? Love your neighbor. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. That so gives this concept of self-evaluation. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So that gives this concept of kind of sharing truths that we're learning with each other. But the main thing I want you to see there is that that there are two things going on that he warns about. He says, first of all, you who are walking in the spirit have the ability in Christ to bring restoration to someone who is caught here. So a believer who has been temporarily caught here can be restored by you if you do so gently, it says, right? Don't come, over, don't come to them and say, hey, loser, you're sinning. You, you say, hey, let me, let's talk about this. Let's work through this, right? And then it brings restoration, right? And then pretty soon you're able to help carry them over to being led by the Spirit again. That's pretty cool. But it also says, watch out because you may be tempted by the sin that they're in. Okay? So watch out for that as well. If you're restoring someone, be cautious because you may begin to feel tempted by whatever sin they're in, right? And that, that for me, I remember I had, I, my, my best friend... After I got sober, I remember I was very vulnerable when I'd be around him because I was just so used to what we used to do together, which was bad stuff. So I had to guard against that and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure there's boundaries and limits here because I may feel tempted by what he's doing because it's so natural. Okay? <clears throat> so we, have, we see this ability of crossover. Christians can get caught here but you can help restore them, okay? Now, Christians can also be tempted back over to this side, too. We, we, we always will, in the flesh, battle the flesh to a certain extent, okay? That's why we, we, we do have to keep a guard up against the works of the flesh. Amen? Think of it like that classic board game, Shoots and Ladders, Okay? Following the Holy Spirit is like you're slowly kind of climbing that ladder, one foot in front of the other, led by the Spirit, up in the goodness of Christ. The shoots are quick. Zoop. We feel tempted. We allow a sin in our lives, and quickly that sin begins to, we slide, we backslide, right? But we can always ask God's forgiveness and come to the ladder once again. The stairway to heaven. Okay, let's keep going. It says, do not be deceived, he writes. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Okay? Paul gives this stark reminder, a man will reap what he sows. Okay? And what is reaping and sowing? Sowing is throwing seed. Right? You're sowing a seed. Reaping is after the seed has produced a harvest, you harvest the crop. Right? So Paul is giving us this reminder that you, you want to plant by the Spirit with actions and words in the Spirit, and then we will reap eternal life. But if we are consistently sow, sowing to the flesh, we could end up reaping destruction. Okay? 
the fruit of the spirit uh, builds up. It like it bubbles up like a fountain bubbling up to eternal life. Okay, so we see that these fruits of the spirit. You can't even read that. Darn it. <laughs> fruits of the spirit lead to eternal life, and the acts of the flesh can lead to everlasting destruction. Okay. But understand, if someone is sowing to the flesh, they can always repent, ask God's forgiveness, and they will be completely forgiven. So if you ever do find yourself kind of caught in this cycle, ask God's forgiveness. He'll forgive you, and it's like it never happened. That's the grace of God. So here's here's an interesting question I thought. What if I'm doing both? What if I'm sowing to the spirit and sowing to the flesh? Because I there's been times in my life where I was kind of double-minded and I'm kind of doing both. I thought to myself, well, I think one would have to crowd out the other. I think that the spirit would be speaking to me saying, yeah, you're not supposed to be doing that, right? C- clear that out and I'll help you to, to clear that out. And then I'll want to and I will. Or maybe I'll... Or, or, or maybe the sin is going to start saying, ignore what the Spirit's saying. Then I start ignoring the Spirit and quenching the Spirit and saying, no, I like this, this sin. And then it goes in that direction. So I think just one can crowd out the other eventually. Okay. So we see this process kind of, and you see at the top, all this is sowing. Which direction am I going to sow? And we as Christians are naturally going to sow in this direction. But we may at times feel tempted to sow in this direction. It's a good reminder to just say no to the flesh and say yes to the spirit. Amen? Okay. So in all this, I want you to recognize as well that we're not adding anything to our salvation here. Okay? We already wear the robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're simply doing two things. We're living out the lifestyle of someone in relationship with God which is loving our neighbor. And we're, we're being careful to not dirty the garment he's given us, if that makes any sense. We're, we're walking in a way where uh, we're walking in purity. We've added no new garment to the robe. Indeed, we cannot. Christ is all. His righteousness is perfect purity. We can add nothing to it. Lastly, Paul gives us this great reminder, you guys. And this is a reminder I needed here in 2024. (laughs) Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all the people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. God knows that we will at times start to feel weary in doing good. We keep living clean. We keep living holy lives. We keep resisting the flesh, doing good deeds in the name of Jesus. But it can be tiring, and you're like, oh, I just keep trying to live that Christian life, and I see all these people around me sinning and drinking and drugs and partying, and you start to think, well, I want to indulge a little too. Can anyone relate to that? Maybe a little. A little bit. And God reminds us, don't become weary in doing good. This has a huge value in just living what it means to love Jesus. It has such a good value. And it becomes this cycle of reaping a harvest of good. Okay? God says, if you don't give up, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. You'll reap a harvest of good, right? God's going to reward us for every good thing we ever did on the earth. We've got to remind ourselves of that, that your service is not in vain. It matters. It matters so much. And sometimes after a busy day, I get home and I'm like, did that even matter? Yes, it did. i got to remind myself it does matter. It does. God is not going to lose track of, of those good things. And he says he will reward us. You know? We get to heaven because of Jesus Christ alone. But anything, any good works, he, he rewards us above and beyond, right? It's not how we get there, but we're rewarded for the good deeds we did. So just, I, that's something I remind myself of, that every good thing you do, Justin, does matter to God. It is precious to him. 
But notice also in the cycle of the flesh that you can reap a harvest of destruction as you, uh, as you live in a cycle of sin. I remember before I was a believer, I was caught in that cycle of sin where uh, it was terrible just being addicted and kind of you end up in this repeating loop, you might say, of just not getting anywhere and just kind of stuck. And the enemy tries to kind of lock you into that cycle, right? Where you're there and you're getting worse and worse and the cycle is getting lower and lower. But when God told me, cry out to Jesus Christ, then he broke me out of that cycle and set me in a new cycle. Okay? You know, in that episode of Star Trek Voyager, Harry Kim was tempted because he wanted to find a faster way home. He became prideful in his own abilities, thinking he could do the impossible, and that led to destruction for the spaceship. The ship was blown off course and crash landed on a nice planet. Certain choices we make are routine. Certain choices we make are minor. Certain choices we make are big, right? I'll give you an example. Someone came up to me with some drugs and said, hey, you, you, you want to do this? No one will know. That's, I'm about to make a big decision when I say no, right? It's a big one. The Holy Spirit will help you to recognize those key mo- moments and to choose life. But guard against pride. Pride says, I can do it on my own. Pride says, I don't need to listen to the Spirit. I know better. Guard against pride. Stay humble in this process of sowing to the Spirit and stay patient. Keep sowing. Don't give up and you'll reap a harvest if you don't quit. And all that is kind of is all surrounded by this one concept of love your neighbor. Fundamentally, the flesh is focused on self, me. Fundamentally, the spirit is focused on others. Love to others. To review. To review, God first gives us freedom to humbly learn, love and serve our neighbors. Two, be led by the Spirit, not by the fleshly desires, right? Indulgence in the flesh leads to the acts of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit leads to the fruit of the Spirit. One caught in the flesh can be restored to the Spirit, right? One in the Spirit can be tempted into the flesh. Our actions repeatedly sow either to flesh or destruction. The process of sowing to the flesh leads to destruction. The process of sowing to the Spirit leads to eternal life. And if you do become weary in doing good, remind yourself of the glorious harvest of eternal life. Amen. Wait, wait, okay, hold on. In conclusion, like the Starship Voyager, there are things that can lead us off course and toward the direction of destruction. But like in the scenario we discussed, we can find a miracle happen We can be brought back to the right path. All it takes is repentance and faith. Every single person born is born into the flesh. They seem destined for destruction. It it almost seems inevitable. I remember me. I just felt I am destined for destruction. I am destined to be lost. I was even suicidal thinking my only course out is, is is to die. That's a low place to be. But God helps us in that dark place. I could taste it, though. I just felt I'm I'm meant to be lost. And God said, no, you're not. No, you're not. I cried out to Jesus Christ because he inspired me to, right? That didn't come into my mind for myself. And suddenly, time, space, and reality was forever changed. Everything changed in a moment. I went from filthy rags to purest garments. All it takes is calling out to Jesus Christ. Even if we've fallen from grace, we can come again to him and find repentance and renewed purity. It's a history-changing miracle. It changes our future forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these instructions in Galatians about living by the Spirit. God, we, we know that flows out of a loving relationship with you, God, naturally. To help us to walk in that loving relationship with you, Father, to receive your love and to give love back to you. And then that love's going to overflow as love to our neighbor. And that is walking by the Spirit. But God, when we are tempted by the flesh, God, help us to say no in the name of Jesus, to recognize that pathway where it leads and to just simply not go there, God. We thank you, God, for victory over that. In Jesus' name, amen.